Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want to focus on these next couple of days on your leadership gift. And I want you to take some notes tonight if you can. Find something to write on, on some thoughts that I want to lay a foundation for you. Some of you are politicians, others of you are involved in government agencies. Some of you in this room are business people or you are budding business leaders. Some of you are in church leadership, pastors and deacons and prophetess and different positions that you have. And some of the young people here tonight, which I'm very excited to see, you have a desire to see some things happen in your country and you want to be a part of it. Well, we're going to talk to you about discovering your leadership greatness because this is really what leadership is about. It's about discovering your greatness. But the greatness I'm going to talk about is from a perspective that is different from the traditional perspective. I want to begin with an important question that I always ask people wherever I go. And the question is, what is the wealthiest place on planet Earth? And the average person normally think that the wealthiest spot on Earth could be the gold mines of the nations, including this beautiful country of Papua New Guinea. Others think it's the diamond mines of South Africa, maybe, or the silver mines of Peru. Some think that the wealthiest spot on earth might be the copper mines of the world, or maybe it is the oil fields of Iran, or at Iraq, or Kuwait, or Saudi Arabia. Some people think that the wealthiest spot on earth is the gas deposits in the world. Well, I've come to a conclusion that I found the wealthiest spot on earth. And when we were landing here today, I saw one of the wealthiest spots on earth right here in New Guinea. It's not too far from your house, and you probably pass it every week. And here's the wealthiest spot on earth. It is the cemetery. And people ask, why is a cemetery the wealthiest spot on earth? The answer is not difficult. The cemetery is the wealthiest spot on earth because buried in the cemetery are books that were never written. The graveyard is filled with music and paintings that were never painted or played. The graveyard is filled with plans and inventions that were never implemented. The cemetery is filled with ideas that never came to fruition. The graveyard is filled with inventions that no one has produced. Sometimes even the graveyard is filled with businesses that never opened. The graveyard is filled with visions that died as nightmares. The cemetery is filled with great women who died as prostitutes. The graveyard is filled with awesome men who died as alcoholics and drug addicts. What a wealthy plot the cemetery is. The graveyard is filled with dreams that did not become reality. Every time I pass a cemetery, I feel a heavy weight. Not because of the dead people in there, but because of what they carried with them. It is that knowledge of the graveyard that made me fly 29 hours to come here. I came to this country because I knew that sitting in your chair tonight would be the next candidate to add to the wealth of the cemetery. Because inside of you are books unwritten, music unscored, poetry unpenned, Visions unrealized, ideas still trapped, businesses 
unopened. Paintings unpainted. I came here because I'm afraid that the cemetery is about to get some more treasure. I really came to Papua New Guinea because I want to make sure that the graveyards in this country get no more treasure. I came to this nation because I came to help you die empty. And this is what drives me all over the world. It takes me from one corner of the planet to the next. Every culture, every continent I've been because of the cemetery. Because I hate to see people take any more of their dreams to the grave. I hope that these next few hours that we spend together in this nation these days would cause you to also make a decision that I made over 41 years ago when I decided that the graveyard would get nothing from me. I decided that I would die with nothing else left to do. I made a contract with the cemetery that it can have my body when I'm finished with it and I used up everything inside of it. That's my agreement. I am convinced, therefore, that nobody came to this earth empty. Every human, 7.1 billion of us, came to this planet with something that your generation needs. And it is unfair for you to take it back without delivering it to us. My question then is, what do we call this massive wealth in the cemetery? I have one word for it. It's called potential. Why is this wealth in the graveyard called potential? The answer is in the definition. The word potential actually means untapped power. Potential means dormant ability or hidden strength. Potential is defined as unreleased energy. It is buried treasure. Potential is unused success. Potential is defined as stored energy. Potential is who you really are, but no one knows it yet. Potential is what you can do, but you haven't done it yet. Potential is how far you can go in life, but you haven't gone yet. As a matter of fact, I discovered that once you've done something, it is no longer your potential. Potential, therefore, is trapped power. This powerful concept of potential is what motivates the creator himself. As a matter of fact, the creator named himself potential. There are two words that you might want to remember that are very important. The first word is the word spelled O-M-N-I. Write it down. Omni. O-M-N-I. The word omni means all. The second word is potent. We get the word potential from. The word potent means power, energy, Strength, might. Now write the word omni one more time. I write the word potent right next to it. And you create a new word. It's the word omnipotent. We pronounce it omnipotent. It's the name God gave himself. The word omnipotent means all potential, all power. All energy, all might, all strength, 
God says, I am omnipotent, which means that he is full of power. Now, here's a mystery. Everything God created, he built into it the potential principle. Which means that God will always hide the finish product in the beginning. And this is where you and I must discover ourselves. Let me put it this way. I am convinced that God hides the end in the beginning of everything. I am convinced that the creator never begins with the beginning. He always begins with the end. And then he places the end in the beginning. And he gives you the beginning with the end on the inside. This principle is factually truth in creation and in the word. This is why God does not create anything anymore. Because he finished before he started. Listen carefully. This is important. So the creator finished all the trees first and then he put them all in a seed and gave you the seed. And that's why he doesn't create trees anymore. God took all the birds and put them in a bird. And he gave you the bird. So the bird has a flock in it. In every cow, he hid a herd of cows. In every fish, he hid a school of fish. And then he gives you the fish. And then he did the most amazing thing of all. He only created one human from the soil. He never went back. There are seven billion of us on the planet today, and yet he only made one. Think. Use your mind for a minute. That means the creator finished everybody and then took everybody and put them in one body and put the one body in the garden. That's why women did not come from the soil. He went inside the one body, pulled out another body, and called it woman. And then he told the man and woman, take out the rest. And we still getting them out every day. Still getting them out every day. Out of one man, he made all the nations of men. Why? Because he's finished. It's called potential. The potential principle is introduced in the first book in the Bible. Verse 11 says, And the Lord God said, Let the earth bring forth herbs and trees and fruit-bearing plants. And then it says, and let everything that comes forth bring seed after its own kind. And now here's the key. He said, for the seed of everything is in itself. Ooh, that's a good statement. <laughs> for the seed of everything is where? In itself. What he means by that is whatever thing is supposed to become, I hid it in the thing.
This is why the beauty of potential is so important. What he's saying is the future of everything is trapped in the thing. And this is why he said the seed of everything is in itself. Let me give you an example. If I hold in my hand right now a mango seed and I ask you, what do you see with your eyes? You will say a mango seed, correct? Sure, but that's not the truth. That's only a fact. What do I have in my hand? The fact is, I have a seed in my hand. Why? Because a fact is the description of the present state of a thing. I'm going to say it again so you can write it down. A fact is a description of the present state of a thing. That's a fact. This is why you should never believe the facts. Because facts only describe the present state. So in my hand, it is a fact that I have a mango seed. But the truth is not the facts. The truth is the reality of a thing. In my hand, I have a mango tree. But that's not the complete truth either. Because in my hand, I have a mango seed with a mango tree. But the tree and the mango seed also got fruit. And the fruit on the tree in the seed got seeds. And the seeds in the fruit on the tree in the seed got trees. And those trees got fruit that have seeds that have trees that have fruit with seeds that have trees that have fruit that have seeds that have trees that have fruit with seeds with trees that have fruit that have seeds with trees with fruit. So I ask you again, what do I have in my hand? The answer is a forest. The creator created everything like that. So in every cow, he hid a herd. In every bird, he hid a flock. In every fish, he hid a school. In every boy, he trapped an awesome man. In every girl, there's a powerful woman trapped. And this is why you should never judge people. You don't know what they're carrying. It's called potential. Tell your neighbor, you don't know who I am, so congratulate me now. You have no idea who you're sitting next to. And this is why I say to every one of you, God never created a follower. Hmm. The first human God created, he told him why. He said, I created you to have dominion over the resources of the earth and then he said let them have dominion the whole species are dominators I was not taught that by the British as a matter of fact they taught me to sing a song the British let me sing the song they taught me to sing when I was four. God save our gracious queen. Long live our noble king. God save the queen. Born to rule over us. <laughs> Did you hear the words? Born to rule, born to rule over me. They taught me that at age four. By the time I was six, I believed it. That they were born to rule. They brainwashed us. You sang it too. 
and you are still trying to be delivered from it. They brainwashed us to believe that we were born to be second class and they were born to be superior. And billions of people are still struggling with that brainwashing. And yet God says, he made me to be a dominator. They said, he created you to be a dominated. And so we struggle. Who is telling the truth? God or the British? <laughs> and we are battling that mental conditioning so every time they show up we become intimidated because the remnants of the brainwashing is still present even though you wear a tie and that's why this cousin has come home to tell you Let God be true and every man a liar. Clap. So trapped in every follower, those who have been conditioned to follow, brainwashed to follow, psychologically damaged to follow, trapped in you is a leader. And that leader is screaming. Amen. Untapped power. Dormant ability. Hidden strength. You know, there are two animals that the creator identified himself with. And these two animals are interesting animals. The first animal he identified himself with is the eagle. The eagle is the leader of all the birds. The second animal the creator identified himself with is the lion. The lion is the leader of all the animals. As a matter of fact, here's a puzzle. An army of sheep led by a lion. <laughs> will always defeat an army of lions if they're led by a sheep. <laughs> I'm going to say it one more time because some of you are slow. <laughs> An army of sheep, get it? Led by a lion, will always defeat an army of lions if they are led by a sheep. What does this parable mean it means that leadership determines the quality of the followers it means that leadership can transform cowards into warriors it means that true leadership and good leadership can transform timid fearful people into bold fearless people leadership in other words the quality of the followers is determined by the quality of the leadership and this is why when your your football team is not winning or your basketball team is not winning you don't fire the players Who do you fire? The coach. Now what's amazing is you fire the coach and you hire a new coach with the same players. And the next season they win. Which means there was nothing wrong with the players. Yeah. 
there was something wrong with who? The coach, the leader. So if your organization is not working right, or your department is not effective, they should fire you. <laughs> if your church is not growing, mm-hmm. Uh-oh. Your ministry is not prospering, the ministry is not expanding, then you don't fire the members. You fire who? The pastor. Say it. <laughs> Leadership determines everything. This nation is no better than its prime minister. The church is no better than the pastor. The team is no better than the coach. The department is no better than the manager. So if something is wrong with the organization, it's because of leadership. And this is why when man fell through the instigation of manipulation of the woman, God never asked for the woman because she was not the leader of the home. When something goes wrong in the organization, you always look for the leader. So leadership is the key to everything. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why it's important to understand leadership. The lion is an amazing creature. The lion is the leader of the animal kingdom. Now here's a mystery. The lion is not the tallest animal in the jungle. He's not the strongest. He's not the most powerful. He's not the biggest. He's not the most intelligent. And yet the lion is the leader. Tell your neighbor there's hope for you. <laughs> Come on, tell somebody there's hope for you. The lion is a mystery. The elephant is 80 times bigger than the lion. The giraffe is 115 times taller than the lion. The hippo is 50 times heavier than the lion. Hmm. The monkey is more intelligent than the lion. <laughs> the elephant is more powerful than the lion. The bull is stronger than the lion. And yet, the lion eats all of them for lunch. <laughs> the lion destroys all of your excuses for not being a leader. Everything they taught you, the lion cancels. I'm not the strongest. I'm not the most intelligent, I'm not the tallest, I'm not the most powerful, I'm not the most wise. Whatever excuse you come up with, the lion destroys. Which means that leadership has nothing to do with intelligence, or power, or strength, or size. When the lion shows up, all the animals tremble. Why? A leader has arrived. No wonder why God says, I am the lion of Judah. So the question is, what makes the lion a leader? It's not his strength, not his power, not his intelligence, not his size, not his weight. What makes a leader? I give you one word, and I discovered it. 
The lion is a leader because of attitude. Hey boy, say attitude. attitude. Say it loud. Attitude. And that's what's trapped in this room. See, leadership is 80% attitude and 20% skill. And this is why most of the leaders of history were not intelligent people. Their attitude made them different. And that's why we're here. This week, I have come to work on your attitude. Because once your attitude is adjusted, you'll become a dangerous man or a dangerous woman. <laughs> Write this down, please. Attitude is a product of belief. The lion believes something about himself that makes him dangerous. He believes that he could eat the elephant. He believes that. As a matter of fact, that's where his confidence comes from. A leader has these three principles in their DNA. They develop a belief system that creates an attitude of confidence. What makes a person totally confident no matter what they're facing? What makes them so deeply committed? Their belief system. And this is why you cannot rise above your belief system. Leadership begins with your belief system. When you discover the truth about yourself and you believe the truth about yourself you become delivered from other people's opinions I had to be delivered from the brainwashing of the British <laughs> the difference between a follower and a leader is attitude in other words attitude is natural to a leader you cannot fake an attitude Attitude controls your behavior. It also determines how you respond to life. The, the, the lion looks at the elephant. The elephant is 50 times bigger than the lion. 80 times more powerful than the lion. And yet the lion looks at the elephant. And the lion looks at all that power, all that size, all that strength. And the lion looks and the lion simply thinks. He thinks. Lunch. That's a leader. He reduces the elephant to a meal in his mind. His belief system controls how he sees. As a matter of fact, leaders do not see with their eyes. They see with their belief. You want your business to grow? Stop seeing with your eyes. You know, I built a global organization from nothing. I started five companies and they, they are very successful. And I run all of them still. From nothing. And I still live on an island seven miles wide. I look at the world and I think, lunch. <laughs> Leaders do not see with their eyes. They see with their belief. Because the lion sees the elephant as lunch, what does he do? Instead of running away from the elephant, he runs toward the elephant. See, your belief controls your behavior. 
No one can make you confident. You need to have a delivery of the truth about yourself. And this is why no human can set you free. Don't confuse independence with freedom. I repeat, you are independent, but you are not free. Because no one can set you free. No charter from England can set you free. Jesus said, you shall know the truth. Oh, that's deep, man. And the truth that you know will set you free. The truth about you. And I had to discover that. I discovered the truth about me. And it set me free from other people's perception of me. The lion knows who he is. So he lives out his belief. And he eats elephants. It is my hope in the next three days. That there shall be an emergence of lions all over Papua New Guinea. As a matter of fact, when you have the right attitude, you become unlimited in your thinking. Because your belief system produces how you see the world. And you can be trapped by your belief system or set free by it, depending on what you believe. Do you believe that you are created to dominate the earth? You can know that and not believe it. So I want to wrap tonight up as introduction on a concept called philosophy. Write the word philosophy down if you get some right. The word philosophy is important because this is where leadership begins. It begins with your philosophy. Philosophy is a product of your ideas about yourself and about life. As a matter of fact, the word philosophy is two words put together. It's the word philo, which means to love, and philosophy means to think. So philosophy means to be in love with your thoughts to the point where you believe them. So a philosopher is someone who thinks about their thoughts and thinks about what they thought about while they're thinking what they were thinking about while they were thinking about while they thought about what they thought about and they fall, fall in love with their thoughts so much they believe what they thought about. That's why they think it. <laughs> and every one of you sitting or standing in this room, you have a philosophy. Every human has a philosophy. A philosophy is your belief system. And where did you get it from? You got it from your culture, from your family, from your teachers, from your parents, from your friends, from the books you've read, and what you heard people say. You get your philosophy from your environment. That's why it's so dangerous. Because most of what you heard is not true. But you believe it. And that's why you must check your philosophy because your philosophy determines how you think like a leader. It actually makes you what you are. Your philosophy controls everything in your life because your philosophy is your natural belief system. Philosophy, therefore, is very dangerous because it becomes your lifestyle. Look at these lions. I took this photograph myself. We were on a safari in South Africa, coming up the Carib River by Zambia. And I saw lions kill an elephant. That's leadership at work. Look at it. <laughs> I want you to think of every problem you're facing right now and just simply call it lunch. Look 
at that leader. Now, let me tell you something about leadership. I saw the lions surround the elephant. And then someone, as if gave a signal, they all jumped on the elephant at the same time. One went to the neck, dug his claws in. One went to the back, dug his claws in. One went to the hip, dug his claws in. One went to the head. And they, they were all over this massive elephant. And the elephant began to throw them around like wet rags. Just whoosh, throw them around. And they wouldn't let go. They dug in their teeth and their claws and they wouldn't let go. As if they were committed to lunch. <laughs> the elephant threw them around as if they were just feather. But they wouldn't let go. And they were being tossed around, flung in the air, but they wouldn't let go. And after 25 minutes of watching this, the elephant stopped. And the weight of the lions became like lead because they wouldn't let go. And suddenly, the cats that felt like feather began to feel like steel. And then the elephant collapsed. I learned a lesson that day. Leaders do not quit until they become heavier than the problem. Persistence makes you heavier. Say it. Say it loud. Persistence makes you. Your problem is not a problem. You are a problem. To the problem. If you don't let go. The race is not to the swift. It's to those who endure. We lose not because we lost. We lose because we quit. Is life throwing you around? Is your company putting pressure on you? Is your business tempting you to quit? Maybe that's why I was sent into your life. Maybe your ministry is so stressful you want to give up. And maybe the creator sent me just to tell you, hang on a little longer. It's going to come down. Yeah. Leaders don't quit until they win. I saw these animals totally dominate an elephant because of their conviction and their persistence. Their belief system was so strong that their leadership bought them total dominance. Let me therefore give you a challenge. The problem with most of our organizations, including even our countries, is that we are overmanaged and underled. Managers are a dime a dozen. Leaders are rare. And that's why this conference is being called. Because this nation is crying out for leaders. I meet managers everywhere I go. It's hard to find a leader. There's a big difference between a manager and a leader. And nothing is worse than having a manager in a leadership position. 
Because managers maintain. Leaders develop. Managers keep the status quo. Leaders destroy it. Managers don't want to rock the boat. Leaders build a new boat. Managers worry about the bottom line. Leaders look at the horizon. Managers try to do things the right way. Leaders try to do the right thing. They're different. Managers try to follow policy. Leaders break policy to create new ones. Managers keep tradition. Leaders destroy tra tradition and create a new history. Are you a leader or a manager? Managers don't grow organizations. They maintain them. And this is why we must focus on leadership. If we are going to see a new massive country, I want to give you a definition of leadership that took me 30 years to produce. What is leadership? Very quickly. Leadership is defined as, and it took me 30 years to write this one sentence. Leadership is defined as the capacity to influence others through inspiration, which is motivated and generated by a passion, motivated by a vision that a person has, which is birthed from a conviction that is produced by a sense of purpose. That's leadership. It's very complicated. And each one of you can be a leader, but you got to follow this process. To become a leader, you turn the definition upside down. In other words, leadership begins with, first of all, discovering a purpose for your life, which becomes a deep conviction. That conviction becomes a vision in pictures, which becomes a passion that you want to pursue. That passion then inspires other people. And once you inspire people, they allow you to influence them. And when you influence people, they call you a leader. What this means then is that true leaders do not seek followers, nor do they seek leadership. To become a true leader, the first thing you must discover is a sense of purpose for your own life. Why was I born? What do I feel deeply about? What do I feel I'm supposed to do for my generation? I have a book on the table out there. Please get a copy of it. It's called In Pursuit of Purpose. Until you find your purpose, there's a whole set of books out there on this. If you don't find your purpose, you'll always be a follower. Purpose separates you from the pack. All leaders develop a sense of destiny. Purpose. And that purpose becomes a conviction. If there's no deep conviction in your life, You'll never be a leader. You'll be a manager. Conviction means you have a deep belief that you are important to your generation. And every one of you came to earth with something important to do. But most of us die never finding it. That deep conviction is what produces your sense of of vision. Conviction shows up in pictures and we call it vision. What do you feel deeply about? Most people don't. Because they've been taught to simply get an education and get a job and pay bills and die. No sense of conviction about anything in life. Most people who want to be leaders have no conviction. All they want is a title and a position and some money. What a lousy life. 
To work for money is lousy. Leadership is born when you discover a belief that is so deep, a conviction that is so strong that it becomes pictures in your mind. You ever heard this? I have a dream. I see the day coming where little white boys and little black girls will walk hand in hand. I have a dream. I see the day when a black man will not be judged by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. I have a dream. Do you have one? Have you seen yours? You see, your conviction shows up in pictures. And your pictures creates what? Passion. Where there's no passion, there'll never be leadership. All true leaders live out of a passion. What is passion? Passion is a desire that is stronger than death. Passion is finding something not to live for. But to die for. Would you die for what you're doing right now? That's the question. Leaders are dead people. They died to their own self-preservation. Once you develop a passion, you inspire people. People are inspired by what you are willing to sacrifice for. That's why people don't follow you, because they don't believe you. <laughs> Jesus Christ is an amazing man. He said something one day that disturbed me. He said, A hireling looks after the sheep as a manager. And when the wolf comes, the hireling runs. Why? Because they ain't my sheep. He said, but the good shepherd, when the wolf comes, stands between the wolf and the sheep and gives his life for the sheep. He was separating managers from leaders. Are you leadership material? Have you found something to die for yet? That's the question. You think about it for the next three hours. Because if you are going to be an impact in this nation and make a difference in your country, you cannot think about your self-preservation. We're so busy trying to, to preserve our lives. We have no time to make a life. Words of Jesus again. He said, if you want to be great, he says, then you must be willing to lose your life. Because if you save your life, he says, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, they'll never get rid of you. It's leadership. Young woman, we need leaders who are willing to do what Rosa Parks did. Sat down on the bus in America, in Alabama, and said, I'm not getting up. And they arrested her. And she went to jail saying, I have a right to sit where I want to sit. Are you willing to go to jail for your convictions? Convictions. Convictions. Leadership is about passion. Passion inspires people. Now listen carefully because I'm getting ready to go. If you don't inspire people, you have to manipulate them. And the moment you manipulate people, you are no longer a leader. You are a dictator. True leaders do not manipulate. They inspire. How do you inspire? By your passion. What is passion? Finding something to die for. Are you a leader, young man? Or are you just trying to make a living? This 
this week is your appointment with yourself. I was sent to introduce you to yourself. The real you that's hidden under all of that stuff. You were not born just to pay bills. You were born to pay your debt to humanity. Lead us of a sense of responsibility to their generation. I hope you find it. Do you know how many sperms died for you to live? 499,000. They were all running toward the egg in your mom. And only one made it. And guess who that was? That was you. That means you won the race before you was even born. So you ain't trying to be a winner. You are here because you won. So sit up straight and smile and tell your neighbor, I'm a champion already. Come on, give yourself a big hand. You are a leader already. Look at this man. Do you know him? If you look at the list, he's in the list. He was a lawyer, trained in England, went back home to his country and couldn't practice law because he had a deep sense of purpose for his people. How do you feel about Papua New Guinea? Why did you start your business? Just to make money? What a lousy life. You weren't born just to, to store up money. Mr. Mandela discovered a sense of purpose. It gave birth to a conviction. His conviction created a vision of a new South Africa. That vision became a passion that put him in prison for 25 years. So you want to be a leader? No wonder why it's easy to find managers. Because managers can run when the wolf comes. This ain't my company, I'm gone. This ain't my church, I'm gone. Will you go to prison for your conviction? That's leadership. His passion inspired the nations. And once they, they were inspired, he influenced the whole world. Mr. Mandela never looked for leaders and he never looked for followers. He simply pursued a passion. True leaders never try to be leaders. They try to be themselves. Have you found yourself yet? Our culture doesn't allow us to find ourselves. Our culture trains us to get a job and to pay bills and die. You can never be a leader until you are free from your culture. <laughs> We've been taught and trained to be subservient. Mr. Mandela never sought followers. You know, when I first met him, he changed my life because he taught me these 12 things about leadership. You find a purpose. It gives you a vision. 
that vision becomes a passion which becomes a conviction and that conviction gives you compassion for people compassion means you love the value of humans true leaders love people they don't hurt people they don't destroy people they love humanity that compassion becomes principles principles is when the leader stands on standards by which they function and those principles become values which is their code of ethics they refuse to compromise and steal and be corrupt any corrupt leader is not a leader they are manipulators they are destroyers when you compromise any of your values and sacrifice your code of ethics you're no longer a leader you are a pawn you're being used. That's why true leaders have values. <laughs> the Apostle Paul was a great leader. He said, look, if you want to be a leader, he says, first of all, uh, be a husband of one wife. That's a value he's setting. Do you value your wife more than any other woman? Then he says, you can be a leader, he says. Ethics. Once you have your code of ethics in place, then you set a plan for your company, for your country, for your business. And then the plan produces a sense of persistence because your plan will be challenged. Every true vision will be tested. The only way to prove your vision is true is for it to be tested. Hmm. People will fight your vision. They'll reject it. They'll oppose it. But I learned something years ago until you've been completely rejected, you'll never be completely accepted. Stop looking for approval all the time. If everybody agrees, you're going in the wrong direction. Leadership attracts opposition. Leadership requires dedication endurance and that endurance sometimes demands sacrifice if I tell you my story you wouldn't want you wouldn't want to be me never be jealous of a successful person you never know the price they pay to become what they are Tell your neighbor, if you knew what I was going through, you wouldn't want to be me. Come on, tell him right now. <laughs> we admire Nelson Mandela. Oh, he's a great man. What a lovely man. And we're so impressed by him. You forgot 25 years in prison away from his family. Sacrifice. And the number 12 is accountability. All true leaders are accountable. They are aware that they must answer to a high authority. Never trust a man who's not under authority. Never trust a woman who's not under authority. And finally, passion. I want to close on passion for a second. Passion means a leader finds something to die for. Here's a quote from Abraham Lincoln, the man who fought against slavery in America and was assassinated as president of the United States. He said these words, speaking to the Congress that was against him. He said, I quote, I have said nothing but for what I am willing to live by 
and if it be the pleasure of the almighty God to die by and he did die they shot him that's why we can't get rid of him he's a leader forever Nelson Mandela quote it is an ideal for which I hope to live for and to achieve but if needs be it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die Nelson Mandela I told you leaders are dead people in their mind they're already dead are you dead yet we love life so much we'll always be managers I like this one the best and he called his disciples to him and said unto them I will be arrested and they will scourge me and they will crucify me and they will bury me and the third day I rise again let's get started that's the way he started his mission. <laughs> True leaders, therefore, do not seek followers. They attract them. Leaders attract followers to their passion. Leadership is finding your gift and serving it to the world. For if you want to be great, you must become the servant of everybody. You serve your gift to the world, you become great. Your gift is like your fruit. The fruit of your passion. When the mango tree bears the fruit, it never brings the fruit to you. You have to go to the tree. True leaders do not pursue followers. Followers pursue true leaders. They come to your fruit. They come to, to serve from your gift. They come to receive what you owe humanity. This day is the end of sheep. Today is the birth of lions. When a lion attacks an elephant, it is quite aware it could be killed. Hmm. I wonder if you are prepared for leadership. This week, there shall be a journey. I will take you on a journey. At the end of this week, I will introduce you to yourself. You are awesome. And the truth about you has not been told.
but you will know the truth. And the truth that you discover will set you free. It's been a great night. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.